Hi, I'm Skip Nipper, and welcome to Skip's Corner. I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Not that I'm that important, but I want you to know the foundation for my interest in baseball and Nashville baseball history. I can remember at an early age, my grandfather teasing about baseball, saying it's in the Bible that Moses must have been a baseball fan because in Genesis 1-1, he writes, in the beginning. And I've always got a chuckle about that from granddaddy. He loved to tell stories like that. I also remember him asking me on my 10th birthday who I was for in the World Series, and I said something like, "Uh, who are you for, granddaddy? And he said, I'm for the Pirates. The Yankees always win. And I thought to myself, if the Yankees always win, I'll pull for the Yankees. Of course, the Yankees got beat when Bill Mazeroski had a home run to beat him in the bottom of the ninth of the seventh game and took the World Series championship. And Granddaddy was pretty happy about that. He teased me a lot about it over the years. But he, Granddaddy was an encourager. He was a sporting goods sales rep. He sold several sporting goods lines. And uh, my dad also went to work for him, and I did too in 1972 until he retired in 1976. And dad and I formed our own company, which still exists today. Uh, Dad was one of those encouragers too. He loved sports. He played uh, three sports at North High School in Nashville, football, baseball, and basketball, made some all city teams, became the um, president of the Nashville Downtown Optimist Club. And right in the middle of the time when they were building the Little League, Optimist Little League Park outside of the entrance to Shelby Park on Davidson, And so we were always at the ballpark. Someone asked me one time if I like to hunt and fish. I fished before with my grandfather, but I've never hunted. Dad always had us at the ballpark. I shot a gun one time. At least I pulled the trigger one time at Camp Boxel at a Cub Scout retreat with one of my boys. And Dad was one of those guys that just would always let you play. He always would throw with you or hit balls to you. And I think that's where a a lot of uh, young people Boys and girls get to learn the game a little bit. My brother and I, Jim, also would be in the backyard playing wiffle ball and even keeping score on a makeshift paper scorecard. So those are some of the things that I remember about about, uh, growing up and and the influence of baseball. Uh, A couple of things that carry my baseball history a little bit further, not only with my grandfather and selling baseball equipment, Uh, He sold for a line called Lanham Manufacturing out of Tullahoma, Tennessee, back in the 20s, and their brand name was Worth. And in 1929, when my mother was born, Dorothy Waddell, grandmother and granddaddy gave her the middle name of that baseball, Worth. Her name was Dorothy Worth Waddell. So I have baseball from both sides of my family. The other part of that is dad's brother, Walter, owned Nashville Sporting Goods. And it's kind of funny, dad would be out somewhere and not know, someone wouldn't know him, but when he told him his name, they would always say, is that from Nipper's Corner? And dad would say, no, we don't even own, we don't even own a, a, a street. But dad, uh, John Lohr from the Nashville Stars came up with a concept of Skip's Corner. And now dad, we have a corner. It's not Nipper's Corner, but it's Skip's Corner. Uh, Dad and I took a trip to Chicago for a New Era sales meeting. That was one of the lines we sold for. New Era is a great company that still makes major and minor league baseball caps, among other things. And during that sales meeting, one evening, we went to to the uh, Chicago Cubs game at Wrigley Field. And it was my first trip there. And surprisingly, it was Dad's first trip there, too. But on the plane back home, he started telling me stories about Sulphurdale. And I knew a little bit about Sulphurdale. He played amateur ball after high school. And he would play games at Sulphurdale and talk about the park and maybe hitting a home run there and how odd it was with that sloped right field and the short right field fence. And I was becoming a little bit uh, interested in in the Internet. We were learning uh, more digital things, you know, like our order entry systems and everything with New Era had our own laptop. And so I could Google with the best of them. I think I still can. And I Googled or put in a search engine, Sulphurdale. And very little information came up, maybe a little Wikipedia reference or something like that, but little or nothing. So I asked Dad, you know, to tell me more stories. 
uh, got the idea to put a website together, bought the name sulfordale.com, which I still have. Uh, we printed up some T-shirts and some caps. Uh, New Era actually made us some caps. We bought a tent. And in October, we went to the Oktoberfest at 8th and Monroe and um, 7th and Monroe. And we set up a, a, a tent and all the people from North Nashville and Cab Hollow particularly, particularly that loved talking about Sulfordale, just they came in and they lined up to buy these T-shirts. And I only did that to buy, to pay for the web fees. And a little later, it, it became more obvious that people had some interest and they would, I gave my email address out on, on a business card. People would write me and I was, I even put a book out on the table there, a notebook that people could write down their stories. I entered those on sulfordale.com. Now that's been a long time ago. That was, gosh, 20 years ago or so. And uh, a lot of those people are no longer with us, but the, some of their memories still remain. And even from those early days to today, people write me. And usually the story that they want to tell involves their mom or dad, usually their dad or their grandfather or their uncle, their brother, their sister, their family would go to Sulfordale to watch ball games, not just ball games because there were rock and roll events there. There was, uh, I think there were um, wrestling matches and other events because it was Nashville's outdoor uh, plant, uh, event center. Uh, I have to, I have to stop and say the other support that I get is from my wife, Sheila. Sheila says my wife, uh, Sheila says my uh, baseball is my other woman. So with that, she knows if I'm talking about baseball, if I'm reading about baseball, if I'm researching about baseball, that she knows I'm in safe hands <laughs> because she loves baseball too. And then there's also my brother and his family, my family. They've always been encouragers too. And so by encouraging through some of the things that they've told me about in the last few months, along with John Lohr and some others with the National Stars, uh, some of my uh, fans from from uh, Facebook and uh, Twitter and a few other places. I'm a member of Society for American Baseball Research. We have a Nashville chapter, and there's been some encouragement there to start a blog so that I can start telling these stories. And a couple other people I'd like to acknowledge. One is Joe Casey, who has lived across the street from my dad. I've heard my dad say after basketball and football and baseball practice, he would come home late and all the food would be gone. He had eight brothers and sisters, and then if it wasn't for Mrs. Casey, he might not have had a hot meal some nights. And then there's everybody's baseball uh, guru uh, that passed away a little, over a, year, a little over a year ago, Farrell Owens. He was the eyes and ears and the, and the voice of Nashville's Old Timers Baseball Association, which Dad and I were proud members. I am still a proud member. I love everything that the Old Timers represents. I have a golf tournament in September and raise a lot of money, and we turn around and give it away at our annual banquet, which we just had in February last month. We had Tommy John as our uh, banquet speaker, and we gave away, uh, I think, $36,000 to high school, deserving high school senior baseball players. They don't have to play baseball in college, but they can take that money, and it can uh, alleviate some of the expenses that are placed on families, uh, no matter whether they play baseball or not. One of the things that I like about uh, podcast here I'm learning about podcasting is I have been encouraged to do is to not have an, a video part of it just have an audio and I'll tell you why I like that number one I'm not much to look at I've got my mug on a coffee mug but that's about as far as it goes and that's not the important part I think what we like to say and hear is the important part but I grew up in a time when everything was literally black and white and by that I mean Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz were on TV in black and white. Um, th there was segregation in the city of Nashville, so the schools were either black or white. And as we moved into the 70s, when Nashville became more integrated, you know, we still have a long way to go, I think, but still we have come a long way too. Uh, the aspect of black baseball and white baseball, by this not being a, a video presentation, we can tell those stories and tell those stories in the right way for the, the giving uh, African-American uh, Negro League Baseball its due, if, if possible, and, and the white players who played baseball, too, like with the Nashville Vols and today with the Nashville Sounds. So I like that aspect. So if you have anything that you'd ever like to tell me or ask me to, uh, to talk about, 
be sure and, and email me. Uh, my email address is 262 at downright.com. Uh, excuse me, 262 downright at gmail.com. 262 downright was the length of the right field line down the right field line at Sulphurdale. 262 downright at gmail.com. And I'm on Twitter and I'm on Facebook and I'm on uh, Instagram, either at Mr. Sulphurdale or Skip's Corner. You can usually find that too. So be sure and send me a note. I could use all the followers I can get. We try to get this message out. And if you like what you're hearing, I'll go forward with that. But in closing, I want to talk a little bit about the beginnings of baseball in Nashville. Uh, You have to have three things to play baseball. And a glove is not one of them. In in the 1860s, gloves hadn't been invented, but baseball was being played in Nashville. Um, You have to have a ball and you have to have a bat. But you particularly have to have a place to play. Now, that may be, a, you know, in the neighborhoods, it may be a sand lot. It may be Shelby Park. It may have been old Centennial or, Neg- or uh, at Fort Negley. It could have been at Hadley Park. It could have been a lot of places. It could have been in the street with a cork and a, and a stick. It could be a lot of ways that you could play baseball. And that's part of, I think, the interest of Nashville baseball, or actually baseball anywhere. We've all played it at some point in our lives, haven't we? And Nashville's place to play back in the 1860s, even before if they were playing baseball then, I, see, I know we have a record of baseball being played in 1860, but there's few a few references prior to that, but some of the scores are a little bit more like cricket, so I'm not really sure. But Nashville's place to play was a low-lying area. It was, it was a recreational area between the state capital and the Cumberland River. And there was a spring there, a natural spring. There were several there. There were several there. There was a a salt lick there also by the river. So in 1860, we know that there was a newspaper account of of games being played and an encouragement for others to play. And then something happened that put a stop to that, uh, at, at least being reported in the newspapers. And that was the Civil War. It broke out in 1861 and lasted till 1865. In 1862, the second largest contingent of Union soldiers outside of Atlanta was Nashville. Now, I am not, I've never seen or read anything that says that the Yankee soldiers taught Nashvilleans how to play their game, how to play baseball. I do think they taught Nashville citizens how to play the game they were playing in the North before the Civil War broke out. If Nashville was already playing it, if some, of the, if some of the young men were already playing the game, then certainly they would have had opportunity. If the Yankee soldiers were here in 1862, and I'm sure for some of their recreation, and probably at the low-lying area outside uh, the, near the Cumberland River before the state capital, they would have played baseball there. In 1866, after the Civil War, the first baseball club in Nashville was formed. It was formed by John Dickens, and it was the Cumberland Baseball Club. Now, there's a connection to the Cumberland Baseball Club today. I'm not sure if you'd be aware, but if you'll go to TennesseeVintageBaseball.com, you'll learn about a vintage baseball league that has teams in Nashville, Knoxville, and Chattanooga, Spring Hill, and and, and they play games according to 1864 rules. Really, they're modified 1864 rules. Uh, there's no running past first base without taking a chance that you're going to get put out. Uh, the ball that, hit, that hits the ground in foul territory is foul no matter where it goes, and the opposite is true. If it lands in fair territory, no matter where it goes, it's a fair ball. It depends on where the ball land, first lands. But 1864 rules are just great. I mean, it's... It allows everybody to play. We have some people that are older than me and a lot of guys younger than me, but everybody plays their best to to win. The idea is to win. Um, 1864 rules. uh, The tagline for the Tennessee Vintage Baseball Association is no spitting, no swearing, and no gloves. And it's a gentleman's game and a ladies' game because we do have ladies that also play. But the connection to the Cumberland Baseball Club of 1866 is that there is a Cumberland baseball club in this league. They play their home games at the Hermitage, which most of the games are played in some event venue, such as uh, historic venues, such as uh, Ripavilla and um, 
the Hermitage. If you ever get a chance, go to that website, look for the schedule. I think every other Saturday or Sunday there are games somewhere. I think you really enjoyed it. I tried to play, being the baseball guy that I am, but having the legs that I have and no arm, the arm that I always had, which was weak, I could not play. And I didn't start getting more involved with them, although I would go visit games. And uh, when my dad passed away, we were not able to do a lot of things uh, other than other than care for him. And when he passed, I asked if I could become an umpire. And I'll just tell you, I met some of the greatest people uh, at through Tennessee Vintage Baseball to uh, to get to know, to get to be friends with, to have dinner with, to take trips with. And uh, I just, I'm just so grateful for those guys and gals and how wonderfully they treat me. Uh, I don't have any trouble with them. The umpire in, in Tennessee Vintage Baseball is really an arbiter, although he's called an umpire. If there is a close play, let's say it's second base, and the runner thinks he's safe and the fielder thinks he's out, they have to work it out. Uh, whether they, the runner was safe or out. And if they can't come to a conclusion, then the captains of the two teams are called over and they make a decision based on what they saw. And if they can't make a decision, it comes to me as the umpire. And what I have the option to do, and if, especially if I didn't see the play itself, I can ask them what they saw. I can actually ask a fan, what we call a crank, who's outside the foul line, who's watching the game. I can ask him what he or she saw and based on what they tell me, I can make a decision based on that for an out or whether the runner's safe. So if you get a chance, go see a Tennessee vintage baseball game. It is really part of the beginnings of baseball, and you can see it, the full tilt. I mean, uh, the period uniforms and, and everything. So N- Nashville's low-lying area that was became the baseball field was called Sulphur Springs Bottom. And uh, Grantland Rice in 1908 was a sports writer here. Uh, he was a Vanderbilt grad, played baseball at Vanderbilt, even tried out for the Nashville baseball team. His dad didn't want him to play. He went to Memphis, and he came back when his dad called him and said, there's a city desk job open with the newspaper. So he came in and got it, and then he started writing sports. And as a Vanderbilt grad, he was very uh, informed, informed about Greek mythology and all the classics, and he liked to write in rhyme. And Fred Russell, a protege of his, who was the sports editor of the Nashville Banner until it ceased operations, once said that uh, Grantland Rice changed the name from Sulphur, Dale, Sulphur Springs Bottom to Sulphur Springs Dell because he f- could not find a word to rhyme with bottom. And he, wrote, he started writing as Sulphur Springs Dale and soon shortened it to Sulphur Dale, and the fans loved it. The, the name was shortened, and it's been referred to as Sulphur Dale ever since. Now, there's, a, there's another story between 1866 till 1908, and I'll get into that in another podcast. But I just want you to know that Sulphur Dale had its beginnings back in the 1860s and probably a little bit before, before then. A couple more things as we move into the future. Get ready for uh, April 1st, 2nd, and 3rd as Tennessee Volunteers come to Hawkins Field to play Vanderbilt, the three-game set, and then the Nashville Sounds open on April the 5th. So if you're a baseball fan, uh, may, the Vandy UT game may be a little bit harder ticket to get than the Sounds game, but certainly pay attention and, and check your t- Twitter feed and your uh, news broadcast and see that what those scores and how those games turn out to be because those two, those three Vanderbilt Tennessee games are going to be barn bur- burners, I'm sure. If you'd like to follow along with me, you can uh, you can check with me, like I said, on Twitter, Facebook, or or uh, Instagram, and uh, usually a Skip's Corner, but also Mr. Sulfordale, which is a game I didn't a name I did not give myself, and I'll tell that story at another time. And also John Lore with the Nashville Stars have just been great with for me to support. My efforts, and I love to be a historical advisor for, for that initiative. We're going to bring Nashville baseball, uh, Major League Baseball to Nashville. Just you wait and see. Uh, and John had me put my, like I heard, I mentioned earlier, I had my mug put on a mug, a coffee mug with Skip's Corner on it and a caricature of my, my face. And, and that was done by Anika, uh, Anika Oruk, who is a wonderful caricaturist. She's just a great artist and lives in Nashville, a big San Francisco Giants fan. And she did that for us because she wanted to have a connection to Nashville uh, professional, um, excuse me, Major League Baseball in Nashville as that happens. 
And, uh, and she's just terrific. And uh, through Sabre, I've gotten to know her a little bit better, too. That's another encouraging thing I can do for you. If you're really interested in baseball research, even if you're interested in the metrics part of it, the stats, you can go to sabr.org. That's a Society for American Baseball Research um, uh, website, I think for $65 a year. And you get so many sources for research and, and chat rooms. And we have a local chapter here. We meet quarterly at the end of uh, January, April, uh, say July and October, the last Saturday of each month for a couple of hours and have a few presentations. And that's one of the great things that I really love about Nashville baseball and Nashville baseball history. And you can go to baseballinnashville.com where I write stories and biographies and there's a little fiction in there. And I'll be happy to for you to uh, use that search engine that's there, the little spyglass, and you can look for Negro League Baseball and Nashville Vols. There's a list of every player who ever played for the Nashville Vols. And as I can best tell, there's even a list there for every um, uh, every player who ever played for one of Nashville's Negro League teams, which would include the Nashville White Sox, the Nashville Elite Giants, the Nashville Cubs, the Nashville Black Balls, and the Nashville Stars. Once again, tell me how you like it, how you like this podcast, what you'd like to hear, um, any comments and suggestions, I'm open to that. Just send me a note at 262 downright at gmail.com or send me a message on Facebook or Instagram and on Twitter if you'd like to. I'm glad that you joined me. Thank you for that. And I look forward to the next time that we get together. And just remember, you can, you can, you can enjoy the game of baseball year-round with so many opportunities through uh, digital opportunities through the Internet. So just enjoy the game. Enjoy the game the way it's played. I've said many times in its imperfections, baseball is perfect. And thanks for checking in with Skip's Corner. Till next time, this is Skip Nipper.